come because um, we've been redeemed, because we've been rescued, because we are people in whom God has done um, something amazing. And so we gather this morning to, to worship the Lord as we do on every Sunday, which is the Lord's Day. And uh, as you know, as we've gone uh, throughout the course of this year, each, each Sunday morning we start off with a question from the New City Catechism. And today ha happens to be an interesting one. There are two signs that when the Lord left, left for the church to follow, two um, um, signs or, or ordinances, as we sometimes call them, that signify what it means to be received by God. And one of those signs is baptism, and one of them is communion. And as we think about baptism this morning, um, and uh, as we go into our worship service this morning, um, baptism is a sign and seal of our adoption with the Lord, our adoption into God's family. And Jesus, or well, John the Baptist started his ministry by saying, repent and be baptized. And so the people were being baptized. Then Jesus, as he began his ministry, was baptized uh, in the Jordan River. Even though he personally didn't need a baptism for the repentance of sin, nevertheless, he submitted to that baptism. Later in his ministry, he talked to his disciples and he spoke to them, I have a baptism to undergo. And then when Jesus left... He said, go and make disciples of all nations and do what? Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Why all this stuff about baptism in the Bible? Why is baptism such an important piece of the Christian life? And the answer to that is that water in the Bible, and it signifies many things, but one of the things that water signifies is judgment. Did you know that? Think back to Noah. What happened in the days of Noah was that the whole earth was flooded under the judgment of God. Now, take that image in your mind and think about Jesus' life. What did Jesus do? What was the baptism that he had to undergo? Was it merely the baptism in the Jordan River? And the answer is no. Jesus underwent the baptism of the judgment of God. Under the waters of baptism, Jesus took onto himself our sin. And so when Jesus says to us, be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what we are signifying is that we are going under the waters of baptism, uh, uh, the waters of judgment. The, 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 the symbolism is, is that we are going down under judgment united with Jesus, and then brought again to life as Jesus was brought to life. And therefore, brothers and sisters, we are a baptized people, baptized under the judgment of God, united to Jesus, and raised to life. And so when Jesus left this earth, he said that we are to baptize all those who come to faith in him. And so we want this morning, as we start into this service, to recognize that we are a baptized people. Um, there are other parts to this. We won't get into those. But I want us, as we enter into this time of, of worship this morning, to be able to think, I've been baptized, not merely by water, but into God's family, and water signifies that. And so... Uh, what I'd like to do, something a little different we normally done, is this side of the church is going to ask the question, what is baptism? And this side of the, of the, uh, the church is going to answer the question. And so would you go back one right there? So ready? Here we go. Okay. Amen. And then together, let's read the scripture, Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Would you join me with me in prayer? Father in heaven, we bow before you this morning 
as a baptized people. People who are baptized by the Spirit of God, according to the Word of God, and, Lord, in water to signify our union with Jesus under the judgment and raised to life. We come to you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who underwent a baptism for us, and because of his baptism, we are adopted by his blood. Lord, would you help your people this morning as we come to enter into your presence in all hopefulness, seriousness, holiness, and anticipation of your goodness to us. We love you. We praise you. We ask your blessing on our time together. We ask that we would be able to rejoice in the presence of God because today we know that we belong May you be honored, praised, lifted up, and magnified in everything that is done this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, constant, and constant in the trial and the change. This one thing remains. One thing remains. One thing remains. And it's higher than the mountains I face. Higher than the mountains that I face. It's stronger than the power of the grave. And constant in the trial.
love, right? Because of that, we can trust him no matter where it takes us. Let's sing this next song, Oceans. Sing, you call me out. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I will call, and I will call. abounds in deepest waters. Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't start My soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine, oh, I am yours, oh Lord, I am yours, Lord, and you are mine, oh, I am yours. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence Savior, and I will walk, and I will call, and I will call upon your name, and keep my eyes above the waves, when oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. 
for I am yours and you are mine. Lord, we're thankful this morning to be called yours. We're thankful for all that you did for us, Lord, calling us, Lord, redeeming us, loving us, Father. We thank you for all this in your name. Amen. Good morning. Uh, our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Peter 2, 18 through 25. Slaves, submit yourselves to the masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. I was on the phone with my mother recently, who lives in Ohio, and she was telling me about something that happened to her while she was at work. Now, she works in, uh, in a healthcare uh, office, a rather secular building, and she is by far one of the only Christians that are there. And one time she was, um, and everybody knows that she's Christian, and one time um, uh, her boss was having a meeting with some other workers, and they were kind of gathered in an office space, and they were joking about Christianity and, and church and making fun of Jesus and Christians in, in one little area there. And so my mom walked into the room, and as soon as she walked into the room, her boss saw her and told everybody, except you've got to stop now because she's here. And then everybody turned and started laughing at my mom. And this was not an isolated incident for her. Around the office, she's known as that Christian lady or that church lady, right? And this is kind of what she has to deal with. And if you are a believer, maybe working in a secular environment, you can probably relate and understand to that story. Working as a believer can be a challenge sometimes. Have you ever experienced this before? Have you ever experienced being treated disrespectfully or unfairly at work? Maybe you're here this morning and you are in a position where you are experiencing this. Maybe your boss mistreats you or people ridicule, ridicule you at work. Or maybe you're here this morning and you have a great job. Your boss treats you well and you never found yourself in a position like this, and that's fantastic. But Peter speaks to both situations here in our text this morning, and he tells us how we should respond. What should our attitude be towards those who we work with? How should we view and ultimately submit and serve our employers and our bosses? In our text for today, God speaks to us through the words of First Peter, of Peter in First Peter. And so if you haven't already, turn to First Peter chapter two, verses 18 to 25. As we dive into this passage this morning, I want to encourage you that as you go about your work, Jesus sees you. Jesus sees you, He is with you, and He knows and understands what you are going through. And he will give you the strength as you submit to him and entrust yourself fully to him. He will give you the strength and the ability to display his grace in your place of work. And he gives us the ability to respond to mistreatment in a way 
that is drastically different than those around us might respond. And so my main point this morning is this. Jesus empowers us to do our work with God in view. I'm going to break this down in three ways this morning. Learning the context, living as a servant in the workplace, and looking to the suffering servant. So first, learning the context. Peter begins in verse 18 by saying, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. Before we seek to make an application of this text to our lives, it's very important when we come to a text like this to really understand the context and understand who Peter is talking to. When Peter uses the word servants here, it is the Greek word oikides, which means a household or domesticated slave. And the fact that slaves are mentioned in the Bible can be a challenging thing for us to come to terms with because we know and understand how wrong this is. And we know and understand this is a very difficult thing and it's an injustice. Um, And we know and remember the horrible and unjust treatment of slaves in America in the last couple hundred years. And so how do we approach a passage like this that deals with this issue? How do we approach a passage like this that talks and addresses people who we know and understand is completely wrong, and we as Christians believe in the equality of all humans, regardless of race, and we know that each person is created and valued and created in the image of God. We need to understand first, in in the context, that slavery in biblical times was different, not any better or worse, but different than the, that, the, the slavery that we most commonly think of in America. Slavery in the Greco-Roman world was not a matter of race, and it was more of a class-based system. Those who were slaves were mostly people who had been captured in war, and they were prisoners of war. And um, there also were just those who were born into a slave household. Um, And also, a lot of people would sell themselves into slavery because being a household or family slave was in some way better than being a free peasant living in poverty because they had better benefits and economic mobility and social advantages as someone who was employed. Also, many of those who owned slaves actually treated them with dignity and respect, and some were treated like family. You might remember the story of the centurion soldier in Matthew chapter 8, who was greatly concerned by the fact that his servant was ill. And he took great care to take his servant to the Lord and seek his healing because he wanted him to be better. But though it was different in this sense, we also have to know and realize that by no way was it right. It was still an injustice. It's still involved the owning of one person over another and the denial of someone's freedom. Slaves were still under the control of their masters and they had no legal rights or no independence of their own. Many were abused and treated with cruelty. So I'm not saying that it was right, I'm just saying that it was different in that sense. So why then does Peter say servants submit to your masters. Why do you think Peter says this, or Paul elsewhere in the New Testament, why do they speak to slaves instead of outright condemning the practice? This can be kind of difficult for us to to grapple with sometimes. And so it's important to understand that when Peter addresses slaves, addresses servants, he is not by any way justifying the practice. He's not saying that this, this is right but rather he is meeting them where they are and teaching them how to live as believers in their current setting. He's showing them how they are to live in their broken world. And as one author put it, biblical instruction is not biblical approval. There's a lot of things that the Bible talks about 
that we might not necessarily approve of, but that teaches us how to live in, within the confines of what's going on in our culture. Jesus did not come to start a social revolution, but rather a spiritual one, a spiritual revolution. And we get that mixed up sometimes in our culture. And the message of Jesus is not to transform social structures, but rather to transform people. And it is through the message of transform people that social change can happen. And that's very important for us to understand as we think about this in the context. And so many people that Peter would have been talking to in, in this world, the believers of First Peter were, might have been slaves. A lot, a lot of slaves that lived in this time, in, in the dispersion that Peter was addressing. And so Peter, talking to them, he is coming down to their level and meeting them where they are and instructing them on how to live and glorify God in their current setting. So though we might not find ourselves in this position today, many of us still deal with an unpleasant work environment. Many of us still might have difficult bosses or people who might not treat us well. So how do we live as a servant in the workplace? Look again at verse 18. Peter says, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. This is a challenging verse for us, and it goes against the grain of our society. How do I submit to my boss when a promotion that I really, really, really wanted and thought I deserved was given to somebody else who was way less qualified? How do I submit to my boss when they don't ever appreciate me or honor the work that I do? How do I submit to my boss when they make me do someone else's work or make me do something that is way off of my job description? And when people in our society or people, even, even us in our own flesh sometimes, when we are mistreated, how do we normally want to respond? Right? People in our society, right, when they are mistreated, they respond with revenge or retaliation, want to get back at them make their life miserable, do the same thing that they did to them, right? We might be tempted, if we are mistreated, to, to lash out at our boss, attack their character, start spreading rumors or gossip about them. You know, actually, the Internet even told me that if you want to get back at your boss, you can put something foul-smelling, like an animal carcass, in their car or their office. <laughs> now, nobody would ever do that, right? But it just goes to show how much that as a society and as people, we have this desire to take revenge or retaliate against people. And one of our natural inclinations when people mistreat us is respond with revenge or retribution or vengeance. Another thing that we often people do when our society and we are mistreated at work is to just simply quit, quit our job on the spot. Now, Please hear me and know that sometimes this is right. Sometimes this is a justified thing to do. And there's definitely times and places where you might have to do that. But when we look at this passage in its context, we have to remember that the people who Peter was addressing, the servants, the household slaves, did not have that opportunity. They had no freedom to just move on from one job to another job. They could not do that. They had no legal protection against mistreatment. So yes, we have far more freedom today to be able to do that. We have to remember who Peter was talking to and remember that in our context today, in our present circumstances, God's desire is for us to glorify him where we are. Sometimes that might lead to other things, right? But where we are, where God has currently placed you, God has called us to submit whether our bosses are just or unjust, fair or unfair. So how do I submit to my boss? What helps me to endure when I am in a weak spot? When I'm in a weak spot at work, what helps me to endure? 
First, we are to have reverence for God. Reverence for God. Looking at, again at verse 18, I know I've been here for a little while, but uh, Peter says uh, to, to be subject to your masters with all respect. And this word respect is a very important word here in this verse. And it is the, the word in the Greek is the word phobos, which actually means fear or reverence. And it's actually the very same word that is used above in uh, the passage that Paige preached about last week in verse 17, where it says, fear God, honor the emperor. And this word fear is the same word, same Greek word as the word respect here in this verse. Um, so why is this important? Because our submission to those who are over us often does not flow out of our own strength, out of our own capacity, but it flows out of our submission to God first, out of our fear to God first. Oswald Chambers said this, the remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. But if you do not fear God, you have every reason to fear everything else. Living your life with a fear of God inspires you to worship, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of your problems or your issues. Right? When we have a fear of God, it shifts us from being overwhelmed by our situation to seeing our issues through God's eyes, to seeing what from his perspective and his lens. Sometimes it might seem like the people that we work with are not worthy of our respect, but God is worthy, and God is worthy. And when we live our lives in complete submission to God and yield to him in complete faith, and he will show us how we can respect those who might seem unrespectable. He can show us how we can do this in our places of work. So secondly, be mindful of God. Peter says this in verse 19, for this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, some of your translations might say conscious of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. John Bunyan, who you might know as the author of The Pilgrim's Progress, was a pastor in the 1600s, and he was arrested for preaching the word of God. He was charged for not conforming to the National Church of England. Shortly after he was put into prison, and he was in prison for 14 years, and shortly after he was put into prison, his pregnant wife went into labor and the baby died. And John Bunyan dealt mightily with the grief that came from being separated from his wife and his family. He struggled through times of feeling lonely in his periods of deep grief and sorrow. But while he was in prison, he found great comfort and strength in the promises of God, and he, he had this to say. He said, in prison, Jesus Christ was ever, never more real and more apparent than now. Here I have seen and felt his presence. Though he was the victim of unjust suffering, Bunyan knew that God was with him. And he understood. And he was fully confident and submissive to the will of God in that moment. This is what it looks like to be mindful of God. Despite your circumstances, we can be mindful of God and who he is. Do you trust that God is in control? Do you trust that God is sovereign over your life? Do you trust that he's holding you in his hands? He knows what you're going through and he'll give you the strength and the direction to know what to do. When you feel like you are suffering and you feel like you do not know what to do, be mindful of God. Remember how he has been faithful to you. Dwell on his word and his promises and trust that though you might not be able to see it sometimes, he is working. Isaiah 26, 3, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. When you are mindful of God in the midst of suffering, Peter says this is a gracious thing. It is a commendable thing. 
It is gracious to God, pleasing to God. When all else might be crumbling, you can look to him and confess that he is God and he is good. Third, do good. We see this in verse 20. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. If I were to work at a job and then end this job, steal money from the cash register, and then I get fired, there would be no credit to me whatsoever. I got what I deserved, right? That suffering of me being fired from my job was deserved. The punishment would fit the crime. But if I do my job well, ethically, honorably, work hard, and do good, and always seek to glorify God, and then I suffer for that, Peter says this is a gracious thing. Paul wrote in Romans 12, 21, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. When you are mistreated at work, you can choose, instead of being overcome and overwhelmed by evil, you can choose to go on the offensive and do good. Pray for your boss. Pray for those who are hurting you. Give them a Christmas gift or write them a letter and tell them you're thinking of them. Write them a birthday card. Do something that serves them in some way. Write them a letter. Go out of your way to serve them. And it might not be reciprocated. They might not thank you at all for that. But in my own life, I found that serving those who irritate me often softens my heart towards them. And it gives me a better understanding of who they are, releases that bitterness from my own heart. And this verse says that when you suffer for doing good, it is a gracious thing. Remember the story of Joseph in the Old Testament, right? He treated Potiphar, his master, with respect, was always acting with integrity. But yet he was wrongly accused of a sinful act. And then he was thrown into prison for that. But yet, in Genesis 39, 21, it says this about Joseph. The Lord was with him and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. God was pleased with Joseph and showed his favor towards him, though he was in prison, though he had suffered, and though he was the victim of unjust punishment. And Peter even says it is gracious in the sight of God. Why do you think he says this in the sight of God? Because when you are mistreated and you refrain from doing evil and you instead do good, God sees that and he is pleased. God sees when you do good. And God sees it, and this can be a great encouragement to us. This is very important for us to realize as we go about our work lives, that your coworkers might not ever appreciate you. Your boss might not ever give you the respect that you think you deserve. You might go through a day of work or a week of work or a year of work and never have any words of affirmation for the work that you do. But God sees it. God sees the good that you do. God sees and he honors you and he knows, and this is gracious in the sight of God's eyes. He sees what you do. And when you do your work honorably, when you do your work commendably, and you do good, and you live like Christ, people will notice. People will notice and see that you are different. By doing good, you are displaying the grace of God to those around you. Peter said this earlier in, in chapter 2, verses, verse 12. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. When I was in college, I worked a, a job at a pizza restaurant, and I was by far the only Christian that was there. Um, my coworkers and my bosses, all every, other, every word out of their mouth was a swear word. They spoke inappropriately about girls and told crude jokes all the time, and made fun of customers even when they came in sometimes, right? 
and they were very, very worldly in that sense. And for me, I was a fairly new believer at that time. And so there was great temptation for me to just join in and to, to do that. But by the grace of God, I was able to refrain. Praise the Lord. And, and each day I went to work and I prayed for my coworkers, prayed for my bosses. And I went to work. I did my work honorably. I did the job I was supposed to do. I worked hard. I tried to make an effort to get to know my coworkers, even though they always looked at me funny. And um, I always prayed that God would give me an opportunity to share the gospel. And one day after I'd been working there for a couple of months, uh, one of my bosses just came up to me and said, you know, why are you so different? Why, why are you so different? And so in that moment, I got to tell him about my Jesus and how he saved me and how he brought me from death to life. I had another boss at the same restaurant who also found out that I was a Christian. And he one day just asked me, so what kind of religion are you? <laughs> and that was his question. Um, but and each night, and he had a lot of questions about Christianity. And he um, would always try to poke holes in what I believed. He was a very deep thinker. And he always had a lot of philosophical questions for me about the deep things of God. As a fairly new believer, I did not know how to answer. And he would try to poke holes in my faith and try to bring all these different, um, you know, worldly, secular arguments about the denial of who God is to me. And I would always just try to answer the best that I could and pray for just the words to say. And I always felt like the Holy Spirit was giving me the right words to say in the moment, but it was honestly mentally exhausting because I often did not know if I was saying the right things. He would keep me late at work. After my shift was over, we would talk for hours just about deep things about God. And often it ended up with me leaving discouraged because I felt like I wasn't making any progress or saying the right things. Um, but actually, just last year, six years after I left that job, just last year, I got a text randomly from my boss. So I hadn't talked to you in six years and he said, hey, I want to start reading the Bible. What version should I read? And then he set, texted me back and said, I've been thinking about getting baptized. How do I go about doing that? Six years had gone by. I say this to you to never underestimate what God is doing behind the scenes. Never underestimate how God is using you. When you are displaying the grace of God at work, though it might be difficult, though you might feel like you're not making any progress, God is using you. And when you shine your light in a dark place, God will shine his light through you and use you as his vessel to plant seeds and communicate his word to people. Though in the moment you might not always see it. Do good because this is a gracious and glorifying thing to God. Last, understand your calling. Looking back at verse 21, Peter says, I'm going to just focus on this first part here. For to this you have been called. We were never promised that the Christian life would be easy. We were never promised that following Jesus was going to be a walk in the park. If anybody ever told you that, they're wrong, right? In fact, we're almost guaranteed that it'll be the opposite. When their young scribe came up to Jesus in Matthew chapter 8, verse 19, and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever I go. Jesus said, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. As believers, we can expect suffering. We have been called to follow Jesus. And Jesus suffered. And when we walk in his footsteps, we know and can expect that suffering will come in this life. Peter says, to this you have been called. But why? Why do you think God allows us to go through suffering? Why is this such a part of the Christian walk? Why does God put us in tough situations and allow us to suffer and go through hardships and trials. I don't have all the answers here, 
But I do know that God sometimes uses these to teach us to be more reliant on him. And, he, and through hardships and through sufferings, God uses those to grow us in holiness and to make us stronger. If you were going to make a piece of pottery, right, you take a piece of clay and you put it into the fire and the fire refines it and, and it makes it shiny and beautiful. Without that fire, it would just be a boring lump of clay. But the fire transforms it and makes it its beautiful state. When we trust in God through suffering, God is making us stronger, growing our faith stronger, refining us, purifying us, sanctifying us, making us more like Jesus. And so if you are suffering, know that God is making you stronger through this as you endure, as you trust in him, as you walk in him through faith, being mindful of him. God is growing you closer to him and growing you more and more like Jesus. So how are we able to endure suffering? How are we able to do this? We are to look to the suffering servant. Jesus is first our example to follow. Peter says, he suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in his steps. Look at verse 22. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Jesus suffered and died as an innocent man. He is the suffering servant, the one who suffered unjustly. He was beaten, mocked, scorned, and bruised, and he never deserved that. But though he suffered mightily, he never, ever, ever once sinned. Verse 23 says, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. I think P Peter, writing this, may have had in mind the time when they were in Gethsemane, and the soldiers and Judas came to arrest Jesus, and Peter cut off one of the soldiers' ears. And then Jesus rebuked him. And Peter was probably flabbergasted, thinking, I'm just trying to protect you. I'm trying to do what is right. But Jesus says, no, retaliation is not the answer. When Jesus was before Caiaphas and the council, and they were accusing him of blasphemy, Jesus remained silent. They spat on him, and they slapped him, and they mocked him, and they accused him, but Jesus never gave in. When he was being mocked by Pilate's men, and they crushed the, thorn, the crown of thorns on his head, Jesus never fought back. He never threatened. And when he was being reviled and hanging on the cross, about to die a gruesome death that he did not deserve as an innocent man, he did not fight back. He did not curse those who put him to death. But he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus is our example. He did not sin, but he entrusted himself completely to God. And through this unjust suffering, the one who is just, God, brought about his justice, paving the way for us to be redeemed. So not only is Jesus our example, but he's also our empowerment. Verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on that tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. You might notice the reference to Isaiah 53 here in this passage. When Jesus died on the cross, he took our sin and our shame upon him. And it is through this death that you who believe in him are no longer enslaved to sin. The enemy has no power over you. Though you might be suffering in this earth and suffering unjustly, the suffering is not the end of your story because Jesus has won the battle, because Jesus has won the victory for us, and Jesus has made us new. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The death of Christ is your victory. 
It's my victory. It's our victory. And because Christ did this, because he died for us, we are able to live to righteousness. Jesus empowers us to do our work with God in view because he endured the cross with us in view. The ability to endure suffering does not come from our own strength. It does not come from our own power. It comes from Jesus, who gives us the ability to do this, who died for us and sent his spirit who lives inside of us, and the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is empowering us, giving us the ability to live like him and glorify him in our daily lives. So lastly, Jesus is our overseer and shepherd. As I close, I want to look here at this last verse, verse 25. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. A couple of years ago when I was in Alaska, I went on a hike up a mountain. And we had planned to go on this hike for a couple hours and be up and down before lunch left in the morning. You know how plans go. They don't always work the way that you (laughs) anticipate. And we didn't bring a whole lot of water when we went on this hike. And as we started going up this mountain, we realized there was no trail. We kind of had to bushwhack our way through weeds and bushes, and, and we were following flagging tape that was hidden in the trees, and it was really hard to see. We kept getting turned around time and time again. We would see the same things that we already saw. We kept getting turned around, going the same way different times. And we'd been going on for hours and hours and hours into the late evening before we reached the summit. And as we were getting close and close to the top, about a quarter of the way up the mountain, we all ran out of water because we did not bring enough. So we were getting dehydrated, weak. A couple people that were with me were really starting to almost collapse because they had no energy left. But as we got up to the summit, we realized that on the top of the mountain, on a hot July day, there was snow on the top of the mountain. There was snow up there. And so, praise the Lord, we were able to fill up our water bottles with snow and have enough for the way back down. When we felt like we had nothing left to give, the Lord provided. When we felt like we were at the end of our rope, God reminded us of his presence. And so for you, brothers and sisters here today, know this. When you're at the end of your rope and you feel like you cannot endure anymore, when you feel like you have nothing left to give, when you are suffering and you have no strength left, do not forget the Lord's promise to take care of you. Do not forget that he is with you. Do not forget that he is the shepherd and overseer of your soul, that he will provide, that he will take care of you. He watches over your soul. He is with you at all times, strengthening, providing, caring deeply for you. And as your shepherd, he will lead you and guide you and direct you so that you will always know what to do because he is leading. And when you are in the midst of suffering, he says this to you from the words of Isaiah, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. Let us remember that and dwell on this promise today, that the Lord is with us. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how it challenges us, Lord. I know this is not an easy passage. It's not easy to think about doing these things. But thank you, Lord, that you give us the ability to do this. Thank you that you empower us. And I pray that we would look to you, that we'd be mindful of you, that we would do good. And that we would always remember, Lord, that you are with us. In your name I pray. Amen. Sing humble king.
servant king, a friend to me. You saved my soul and washed my feet. Here I'll bow, give all to you. Lord, I want to be like you. All I want. And all I want, and all I need, more of you, less of me. Take this life, Lord, it's yours. Have my heart, have it all. will walk in your ways and I will walk in your ways love your word seek your face and my reward my soul pursued to know Thank you so much for bringing the Word of God to us. Um, 
I hope that uh, you heard the Lord speaking to you. And just as we close this morning, you know, I was just sitting here thinking all of us um, have workspaces, places where we're working. And um, those places are places for us to put on display our hope in Jesus. And what a venue for servant-mindedness. And so I would pray this morning, I want to pray for us before we close. This isn't, I have some other things I need to cover, but I want to pray for us that God would help us in our workspaces, whether the environment is great and easy or the environment is, is really difficult or somewhere in between, that we might be a people who are doing what Peter is telling us. This is how you put on display your hope in Jesus and not in this world. Would you join with me in praying? Lord, um, we just bow before you before we close. We don't want to just rush out of here. We ask for grace this coming week. Maybe there's somebody here this morning who really is finding <clears throat> life challenge in their workspace. Would you give that individual grace and strength? and patient endurance? Would you give them a willingness to look at their work situation through your eyes? Would you help them to cast themselves upon their shepherd and overseer of their soul? And Lord, for all of us, would you help us to see our places of work as places where we are displaying our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself suffered so that we could say no to sin and yes to righteousness. Would you help us to do that, Father, I pray, and strengthen those in our congregation who find themselves in situations that they'd rather not be in. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I do want to say, if I get a dead carcass in my car, <laughs> I'm going to know where that came from, and life's not going to be happy. So, um, just in closing, as we close this morning, a uh, couple things I'd like to make you aware of. I, first of all, I forgot to uh, announce the birth of Titus Eliezer Yoder. Where are the Yoder family? Where are they here? over here. And um, so we're excited for you guys. Uh, that is number nine, which is stunning, we know, but um, praise the Lord. Um, a couple other things. You see all these baskets that are up here. Um, and so before you leave, we need volunteers to help us. Uh, if you can take one or two baskets, and if you're really feeling aggressive, three um, and you can see where they are, um, the, the location of those baskets by the signs that are there. There's a gift that's in the basket. These go to families that um, we have received names from um, social services. And uh, they, the folks have been told that they're supposed to be there uh, this morning. And there's directions. And if you would just be willing to grab one of those and drop them off, hopefully you can grab one kind of in the direction that you happen to be going. Um, if you get an opportunity to, to engage with that individual, pray with them, ask, the Lord, ask if there's any way that you can pray with them or bless them in some way, please do that. <clears throat> um, we just invite you to, to do that. I would like to ask if you are going to Life Application Group this morning, to take this with you, because if you don't, you're going to forget, and we don't want 25 baskets here um, before everybody leaves. So if you could help us with that, that would be helpful. The second thing is um, our hot or prepared meals on this coming Thursday. Uh, I think in our uh, sign-up, we have a lot of the places that are already signed up, but if you would please check that. You should have gotten an email with a link. Uh, if you could check that, if you're able to help, if you're not traveling uh, th on Thursday morning, 
uh, both in terms of providing food uh, that needs to be in the in the uh, kitchen at 8:15 on Thursday morning, and or if you can deliver meals on those day on that day, that would be really helpful. Um, Guy Tudor, who's sitting over here, far right, up to my my right, your left, uh, is the person that you can ask if you have any questions uh, regarding that. The other thing I'd like to bring up to you is you received a card this morning uh, as you came in. It's Advent Ministry. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, we are uh, into the holiday season, and so we just want to let you know about what thing, things that are, are, are coming. This gives you a schedule of all of the ministries that are taking place during Advent. I do want to point out a couple of things. First of all, on December 18th in the evening, there will be an evening um, um, musical celebration. There's no message, just, just music, some scripture reading. Uh, and so we hope that you'll be able to come out uh, for that. We will have our regular um, Christmas Eve service at 5 o'clock on Christmas Eve and then Christmas Day um, at 10 o'clock. So we will have a 30-minute time change on Christmas Day. Uh, there'll just be a service, no app, life application group that day, but 10 o'clock. Uh, for that. So I just want to make sure that you see that, take note of those changes, uh, and also that the we will not continue our uh, sermon series next week. We will put that aside and pick that up after the Christmas time. We will be doing a series of messages from Isaiah chapter uh, 9, verses 6 and 7. You can see those messages uh, listed there. Finally, uh, if you have any kind of prayer needs before we close, um, if you have any, any issues that you want people to pray with you as we close, our elder and, and, and elder's wives will be up here at the front, and they would love to be able to pray with you. Would you stand for the benediction this morning and invite you after the service to go into the fellowship hall, get some refreshments before you head off to your life application group? Um, and uh, if you don't have one of those, we'd love to help you connect with a life application group. I'd like to give you the benediction from Peter, uh, where Peter says, The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Go in God's grace.